so I want to start off with talking about uh, sort of a very high level uh, overview of how modern computers uh, work and uh, this is not even, there's actually, never mind. So you have a, a few CPU cores, uh, each core has their own memory cache and then you have another layer of larger memory cache on top of that and uh, sometimes cores share cache at different levels. And uh, so this is sort of an example of a, a, a somewhat, somewhat modern uh, uh, CPU core and computer. Uh, why is this relevant? Well, let me show you some, uh, uh, a graph. This is uh, how long it takes, approximately. O most of these numbers are sort of uh, approximate numbers. Uh, it's surprisingly hard to find accurate numbers, uh, specifically if you want for to be, for them to be um, general uh, and apply to all CPUs. This is, uh, I picked the Core i5 Sandy Bridge because it turned out to be the one that was easiest to find numbers on when you Google. Uh, if you have a three gigahertz clock, takes one clock to access a register, so it's uh, you know, a little bit under 0.4 nanoseconds to, to access that value. It's great, fast. Um, now, if you don't have the data in the register and you actually have to go to the, the, the first level uh, the closest uh, cache, the L1 cache, uh, it's going to take about 1.3 nanoseconds. So that's quite a lot longer. Uh, so if you can, you really want to keep your data in the register. Uh, now, the, the L1 cache isn't all that big, so sometimes you might actually have to go to the next level uh, of, of, of cache, the L2 cache. Uh, it's going to take 4 nanoseconds to reach memory. That's even longer. Check it out, like the, the ratio there. Uh, and the L2 cache also obviously is limited in size. The L3 cache is the, you know, you have many layers of cache these days. Um, over 11 nanoseconds. It's a pretty, pretty huge increase in size. And then the worst thing, the thing that you should try to avoid like the plague, is to actually go read things from, from DRAM. It's incredibly slow. That's, that's how slow it is. It's, uh, you know, and sometimes it's even longer than that. Uh, it's sort of in the order of 100 uh, nanoseconds. Um, there's actually another case where these days you have memory banks at attached to different uh, CPUs. Uh, so reading from your CPU's memory is this uh, fast. If you actually have to read from someone else's CPU's uh, memory, it's even slower than that. Anyway, <coughs> um, interesting fact, when a CPU is waiting for memory, it's stalled. It, can't do, it cannot do anything else. Uh, and it will look, in your profiler, it will look like you're using 100% CPU for this time. So instead of spending that one cycle of, of reading memory from the registry, you're going to spend 100 cycles, or no, sorry, not 100, seconds, 100 nanoseconds, not doing anything, just waiting for memory to uh, come back in. And in your profile, you're going to think, oh, I'm using 100% CPU here, even though you're not. Uh, there is uh, there's this thing called hyper-threading, which uh, tries to mitigate this by uninstalling the CPU in some, under some circumstances. Um, so just to make that statement a bit more uh, accurate. Um, now. Um, two points here, access patterns is significant for performance because um, how well you hit these caches will clearly make a huge difference. It's, uh, you know, in my example it was a 61x difference of, of hitting the, um, I think was it L1 and, uh, and, and DRAM. Um, and uh, if you have constant cache misses, if, if your program is written in such a way that you constantly miss caches, uh, you can be up to two orders of magnitude slower than you otherwise would, especially if, you're, uh, if your program is actually uh, using a lot of memory or memory is sort of intensive. So a little bit uh, on how the cache works. If you request a piece of memory, uh, the way the cache will work is that it will actually sort of pick the entire cache line that this uh, read uh, falls into and it will pull it all in. And the reason why that makes sense is <coughs> because 
there's a distinction between um, memory latency and memory throughput. Once you actually, uh, this sort of goes down a little bit to how DRAM works. Once you light up a row in, the, in DRAM, it's actually pretty quick to read all of it into the CPU. It's just that it takes time to light that, that row up. So once you have lit it up, it makes sense to just pull it all in anyway into the cache because you're likely to use it anyway, probably. <coughs> so that's why, th that's why it's doing that. So uh, when, when you access a cache line, you get all of it, and it's very cheap to access things around it. Uh, um, right, this is getting ahead of myself a little bit. Um, not only does it just pull the, the cache line that you hit, but in fact, uh, the CPU has logic in it to, to try to uh, recognize your memory access pattern. And if you're reading sequentially, it will actually predict that you will need the next cache line and the next one and the next one and start prefetching those ahead of time uh, to cut down on latency even more. Um, right, and the other, th the other side of thing is, is the, the same thing happens with not just your data uh, access pattern, but also your control flow, because the instruction pointer, the, you know, executing your instructions, that's another uh, constant read from memory to, to fetch all your instructions. Uh, and every branch that you have uh, means you either keep fetching uh, sequentially or you jump somewhere else and start, start uh, requesting there. If you have to jump, you're going to probably get a cache miss. Uh, so it's important for the CPU to either be able to predict this and start prefetching those cache lines to keep stalls down, um, uh, or essentially not jump, so that you can just keep uh, reading sequentially. Uh, two things to keep in mind. It's, so it's not just your data access. It's also your control flow that, that determines your memory access. Uh, so to, to illustrate this, um, this is a little animation. That's sort of what it's like to, to read uh, sequentially. Uh, it just gets pulled in. Not entirely clear, but those, th those are cache lines that got uh, sort of populated as that read cursor moved across it. Uh, if you instead have a, a random access, you're going to have, you have to wait for it to uh, read in, because there's not going to be any prefetch. And uh, each memory is going to stall. and uh, mem memory fetch is going to stall. So this is sort of trying to illustrate uh, reading sequentially is typically a lot faster than randomly jumping around and, and reading memory from different places. All right, that was sort of the setup. This is the main cause, or a very significant cause of uh, performance issues uh, these days. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how, how you can modify your data structures to better take advantage of the memory cache. Um, so one, one of, uh, common pattern is to have uh, a list of pointers to heterogeneous objects, and you use inheritance and maybe even virtual functions uh, to allow these objects, these different kinds of objects to um, sort of coexist and have some common interface so you can run some, have some operations that are in common on them. Um, uh, perhaps uh, peer connections in, uh, in uTorrent is an example. You have regular BitTorrent peer connection, uh, you have <coughs> web peer connections for uh, web seeds. Uh, so you have a common interface so that you can treat them to some degree the same. Uh, in order to have this polymorphism, you actually need to have a vector of pointers because each object have different size, so you can't just put an array of them. You have an array of pointers. Uh, so you get the polymorphism via pointers. This is sort of uh, very typical for uh, languages and designs that are heavy on inheritance and polymorphism uh, with virtual functions. Uh, an alternative, which might be a little bit crazy, would be to have uh, an array of objects um, of the same kind of object. So if you have, instead of having a single list of heterogeneous objects, 
uh, you can have one list per type. So if you don't have that many types, that might actually be feasible. Um, so in the case of pair connections, you would have one array of BitTorrent pair connections and another array of BitTorrent, uh, of, uh, sorry, WebSeed connections. Uh, one advantage is that these objects then would, not only would you save uh, a cache means when you need to dereference the pointer, but they would also be laid out sequentially in memory next to each other. Uh, so when you need to do operations on all of them, it would be a lot quicker. Uh, also, you would also save on the virtual function dispatch. Um, the reason why virtual function dispatch is expensive is because uh, you need an additional dereference to the V table, and then you need to call a function pointer. Function point calling function pointers is especially exp uh, expensive uh, because, because of the branch prediction. The branch predictor have a very hard time with the function pointer because you need to first fetch the memory uh, that holds the function pointer and then you know where to branch and where to start fetching instructions. Uh, so it's expe uh, especially expensive. Um, so I have a little example to illustrate this. Uh, and I'm using the universal shape hierarchy that everyone presumably knows. Uh, so this is a, uh, a vector of shapes, and I'm using a unique pointer uh, because it's uh, to get the polymorphism there. Uh, the shapes have a virtual function called draw, and uh, so in a for loop, draw all of the shapes. Um, and this would be the alternative approach. You have, let's say that in our program we only have uh, circles and rectangles anyway, so we have two vectors one of rectangles, one of uh, circles, and then we have two, of, two for loops to draw them all. So annotating this and looking at what's going on a little bit. Um, the fact that we have pointers in this array means that all of our data that we're accessing is going to be spread out uh, in memory, presumably. Uh, at least presumably fairly spread out, uh, which means that every access to it is going to be likely to uh, cause another cache miss. Um, and inside the loop, uh, we have uh, we also need to dereference the vtable pointer. The vtable probably after the first time will will stay in uh, in the cache. And and if you have a good compiler, uh, it will actually do a probably a pretty good job of devirtualizing some virtual function calls if the compiler knows about some of the alternatives that a virtual function call could be. Uh, it will actually insert uh, tests. <coughs> to say, if it's this, then do a static call here. Uh, if it's this other pointer, then do a static call here. Else, call the actual function pointer. That helps the branch predictor a lot to, to be able to uh, prefetch instructions. Uh, anyway, still, some, some costs associated with that. Uh, on the other hand, if you have two vectors, uh, all of the objects are going to be packed back to back in memory. Uh, very efficient, and when you loop over them, you're going to read uh, sequentially in RAM. So the prefetcher is going to uh, be able to do a very good job. Uh, when you call draw, it's not going to be um, a virtual function call. It's going to be a static call. So the branch predictor is going to have a much easier time to know what's going on. It's going to be able to prefetch. All right, the, uh, another aspect of data structures is to uh, take advantage of the fact that if you, if you pull in, if you start accessing an, an object, especially if you have a, a vtable, the vtable is likely to be prefetched, which means that the entire cache line that the vtable falls into, which would, be, which would be the first 64 bytes of the objects, will be in the cache. So if you have other fields in your object that are extremely likely uh, to be accessed, especially often, uh, you might want to put those within those first 64 bytes because they will probably already be in the cache. Uh, and, and in either case, put them together so that they all fall into the same cache line uh, and so that they all make themselves, the other ones, be likely to be in the cache. Uh, another uh, approach is to also avoid unnecessary padding. Uh, padding is just going to add additional pressure to your, to your cache uh, because it bloats your data structure. Probably not that big of a deal. Uh, but this is kind of a, a simple approach, a simple example of um, 
what might happen. So the structs on the on the le uh, on the right, um, the order that you the order that you define your fields will actually determine whether you have pack, uh, padding or not. Uh, since the first field is an int of four bytes, the second one is a pointer of eight bytes, there will have to be four bytes padding there. And then you have another int of four bytes. And then you need another four bytes because the whole struct needs to be aligned to the strictest requirement of the field in here, which is eight bytes alignment for the pointer. Uh, if you instead reorder them a little bit, you're actually going to be able to pack them down. So uh, your struct is going to uh, be 12 bytes instead of 16, uh, and you're not going to have just wasted space. So once you put this in, a, in an array and have uh, you know 10 million elements, that might actually make a difference. Um, right. But this is really what I want to talk about: uh, context switching. I think this is the in the interesting part. Um, context switching uh, normally refers to the scheduler uh, switching from one thread to another thread. Uh, I would like to talk about context switching in a slightly broader scope. So, um, what I want to what I want to describe as context switching is whenever you have whenever the program changes from working on one set of data to a completely different set of data. Uh, this is an event where you will essentially wipe out your, your memory cache because you started, work, you started working on a, on a different part of the memory. And if you then switch back again, you're going to start cold and you're going to have to warm up your cache again and it's gonna, there's going to be stalls. Uh, and this does not only happen when you switch between threads, it also happens when you uh, go from user space to kernel space, typically, uh, when you make a system call. Because you have all of your user space stuff going on and then the kernel has all of its own stuff that it's working on. Um, so, uh, what can you do to avoid these kinds of, of context <laughs> switches? Um, you want to amortize the cost of the context switch over as much work as possible. So this means in the two cases of system calls and, and uh, thread switches, pass as much data as possible into every system call so that you don't have to mi make multiple system calls. And, and, um, and try to batch your work so that you can have fewer thread wake-ups and, and thread sleeps um, by doing more work. So this is kind of a rule of thumb that, that I think uh, is good to keep in mind. When, whenever a thread wakes up, do as much work as possible before it's going, uh, it goes back to sleep. Uh, that means if you wake up because a socket became readable, read everything that you can from the socket. Don't leave anything in there. Uh, do all, as much work as possible on the data that you just received from the socket. Uh, it also means if you woke up because you got a, someone posted a job to your job queue, uh, after you're done uh, dispatching that job or executing the handle for that job, check again and see if there's another job there because someone might have actually put another job there uh, while you were working on this, and do that as well, like do perform that work. Uh, you don't want to go to sleep just to wake up very soon uh, after that. Uh, I have this uh, uh, analogy that uh, I'm not sure if it's going to be awesome or not, uh, but uh, you can sort of think of, oh wow, the colors are very poor. Uh, this is supposed to be two roads and an intersection with a traffic light and two lines of cars. Um, if you are wasteful with your context switches, uh, it's as if you had uh, your traffic light let one car through at a time in each direction, which you can imagine is very slow. Um, this would be the equivalent of, I got a job on my job queue, I woke up, I do that job, I go back to sleep again, and then I immediately wake up again because I have another job, and I do that job, I go back to sleep. Um, so what you want to do is, once you wake up, do as much as you can. So that would mean let all the cars through, and then let all the cars through, and then you're done. Much quicker. Um, right. Uh, no, animation. Okay. Um, 
Here's maybe a more concrete example in, in programming. Uh, this is a pseudocode, potentially recognizable. Uh, let's say we wake up because our socket is, uh, became readable. We read one request off the socket, we parse the request, and we handle the request, and then we go back to sleep again. And it's possible that our socket is readable again, but we'll wake up again and, and do the same thing again. Uh, this would be performing one job uh, and then go back to sleep. Wasteful. Okay, so um, if we, we want to drain the socket each time it becomes readable, and we want to parse and handle uh, all of the requests that we received. So again, pseudocode. Uh, read everything from the socket, append it to the buffer that we have, uh, parse a request, and then we get the new buffer with less data in it because we parse some of it out, and we get a request. And as long as we actually got a full request there, handle the request, do the same thing again, and loop over all of the requests that we received on the socket. Great. Um, Uh, and, and actually, you can, take, you can take, take this one step further. Inside handle request, you're likely to maybe respond to this request somehow. Maybe you're writing something to the socket. Um, and writing to a socket is a system call, and it's a context switch. So that means for every request, you will actually context switch into the kernel to write something to the socket, come back again, handle the next request, context switch into the kernel to write something more to the socket, come back. Uh, so you can actually improve that as well by um, corking the socket. And then once you're done handling all of them, that's when you uncork and actually flush uh, the things. Uh, I assume cork is uh, self-explanatory. There's an actual extension in, in uh, Linux to, to do this on socket as well. But it's easy to do in your user space uh, send buffer. Uh, all right, running a little bit short on time. Um, there are two, primarily two different approaches to reading from sockets. Uh, the one that's most popular in POSIX and probably most popular in general is wait for a read, uh, wait, wait for a socket to become readable, trigger an event, and then read that off of the socket. Uh, what you can do in Windows, and it's actually pretty brilliant, is you can say. I want to read from the socket asynchronously. Here's a buffer that I wanted to read into. Um, why don't you tell me when, when you're done? So you, you, you issue an asynchronous read, and then you wait for completion of that read event, <coughs> or, or, or of that read. Um, so to put some concrete code into this, um, this is a somewhat accurate code that would work, assuming everything is correctly set up. Um, this is the POSIX way, specifically BSD with Kvent. You would use other things on Linux. Um, wait for some events. Um, loop over all your events. And uh, in, we assume that it's only readable events. Um, read, read from the socket into the buffer that we pass in, buffer and buffer size. And then we get the actual uh, number of bytes read. And then dot, 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 we do something with that buffer. Um, so to annotate that. Um, that's the, the, the k-event waits for something to become readable. And then we say, OK, now we know that this socket is readable. We can copy the data into, um, into our, from the kernel into our buffer in user space. Um, you can actually, in the case of case queue, actually, uh, you also know exactly how many bytes are readable from the socket as part of this event, uh, which is very nice if you need to allocate more space for your buffer. So you don't need an additional system call to know that. Um, so this is how you uh, would do it on Windows. I had to omit a few things here because it's kind of verbose otherwise. Um, and I highlighted the important parts. You call WSA receive, uh, and um, you pass in an overlap structure. And the overlap structure needs to be initialized. Uh, I omitted that. Not that interesting. Um, so what this does is it kicks off. Uh, it essentially tells the kernel. I want to read from this socket, and here's a buffer that you can put bytes in. And this is how big the buffer is. And then you say, go uh, and wait for completion status. This is um, um, IO completion ports on Windows. Uh, whenever that is done, uh, whenever you get that event, th there's some logic omitted here as well to actually you know, loop over the events and such. 
uh, you ask for the overlap results and you know whether it uh, failed, succeeded, how many bytes it read into the buffer. But then uh, by that time, um, the results are already in the buffer that you pass in. Um, right, that's the, that's the markup. Uh, initiate async operation, wait for the operation to complete, query status, uh, and then you're done. So passing in a buffer up front is preferable because it has the potential of the stack below inside the, uh, the kernel, the NIC driver and the kernel itself, uh, to actually receive data directly into your buffer. So you save a copy. Uh, even if that's not happening, you might need some fancy, fancy drivers and fancy hardware for that to actually happen. Uh, but even if that doesn't happen, you at least can do the memory copy asynchronously without your thread being blocked by anything. So your thread can still do other things while that copy is going on. And copying memory, you might say, is not that big of a deal. But when you're, say, transferring at 600 megabytes per second over a socket, it actually starts to, to matter. So you have one problem then. If you, if you decide to go with this approach where you pass in buffers up front, how big should your buffer be? Uh, if you have a buffer that's too large, you're going to waste memory. And if it's too small, you're going to have to uh, s uh, make many more system calls to, to read into that small buffer. And you're going to you know, waste bandwidth with, to the kernel and, and context switches with the kernel. So one way you can do that is start with some reasonable offer size, issue the, the asynchronous call, and if the number of bytes you get back is exactly, exactly fills that buffer, you can assume that you probably could have read some more and you increase the size. If the asynchronous read returns significantly less uh, bytes than the size of your offer, uh, you can uh, assume that you're wasting memory right now and you should decrease your buffer size. Uh, and if, you, if your increases and decreases are proportional to the buffer size, you'll have nice uh, uh, complexity properties where you amortize the cost and uh, it will end up being very efficient. So this is another rule of thumb that is essentially the same thing phrased in a slightly different way. Um, adapt batch size to the computer's natural granularity. Uh, it, it ties back into uh, adjusting the buffer size. Uh, but primarily it means um, the, the line under here, if, if your load goes up, your efficiency should also go up. If your efficiency stays the same or goes down when load goes up, then you're in trouble, especially if it goes down. Uh, but ideally it should go up. Your efficiency should ideally go up, which means batch, larger batches, essentially. Uh, so, and, and this happens naturally if you, if you are careful when you uh, design your program. It happens naturally by things taking longer, more things accruing during longer time, and you have an opportunity for larger batches of work. So uh, your batch sizes will increase, your latency will increase, but your efficiency will uh, improve at least. Um, and uh, the use of magic numbers uh, is a little bit of a warning flag. Uh, it might be tempting to say, well, I'm going to accrue uh, jobs for 100 milliseconds. And every 100 milliseconds, I'm going to issue them all, um, which might work perfectly for the particular case that you're looking at. But if you have, if you're going to, if you uh, if you have a very high throughput and, and 100 milliseconds means 10 million jobs, that might be too much because then you might, things might be too expensive to, to uh, uh, batch up that much. Uh, and, and in the other, the other end of the spectrum, 100 milliseconds might be way too often if you're on a little I don't know, cell phone that gets one job every second. You're going to wake up 10 times a second only to one of those times to actually do something. Um, uh, so there's uh, one more thing, message queues. Uh, I assume most people are familiar with the message queues. Um, it's not uncommon that you will get a batch of, of, of messages on message queues when you're, when you're doing something. Um, so um, 
I have an example here of uh, we have a, a connection that get, receives a message every time a disk read job comes back with 16K. Uh, this is a little bit tailored towards a, a BitTorrent specific uh, audience, I guess. Uh, so let's say we, have, we issue a disk job to read 16K. We get a message back saying, OK, we've read 16K now. Here's your buffer. Uh, so you might say, OK, I'm going to write this to my socket now, because the other end is waiting for this 16K. I'm going to write it. So the problem is then, what if we want to avoid that write call to the socket until we have accrued some reasonable amount of bytes to actually write? Instead of writing every 16K, uh, when, again, if you're transferring at 600 megabytes per second, a system call every 16K is going to kill your performance entirely. So you want to batch up more buffers. Um, and and one part of the part of the abstraction level uh, lay, the abstraction that you have in a message queue means that it's not entirely trivial to say, well, I want to drain the queue and then I want to do something and then I go back to sleep. However, uh, there's actually a fairly simple solution to this. Uh, whenever you get your your event, you queue up your buffer and you keep a little bit of state saying if you have a, a, a flush message, if you don't have one, you set it to true and you post another message to the message queue. Uh, and once that message comes back, that's when you flush all of the buffers that you accrued. So this, uh, this will cover the case where you have all of a sudden someone dumped 10,000 messages on your queue with buffers in them. And you want to wait for, you want to handle all of them first, and then you want to flush your socket. So what you do is, um, well, here's the, here's the, uh, the annotations. Uh, accumulate the buffers. Uh, instead of writing them directly to the socket, you keep them and you just sort of uh, save them. Um, the, first, the first message you get, you post this flush message to the queue. And once that flash message comes back, uh, it means that we have handled everything else that was on the queue at the time when we posted this. So it will give you this uh, granularity. Of, like It will tell you what the typical expected granularity is. If any of these operations take a very long time, it means that you're going to have, the next time around, you're going to have even more jobs on your queue because there's been longer to accumulate them. Uh, this is sort of an illustra uh, visualization of that. So that's the queue of your jobs. The message handler puts another flash message at the top of the queue, which sort of acts as a sentinel. So when that drops all the way down, that means you're done with the queue and you can flash uh, your, uh, your socket. Uh, another obvious nice property is that you might actually be at capacity, and you might actually get, get um, these uh, jobs constantly. Uh, then th your flash message will still make sure that you, every time you go through one turn, through the loop, you will flush your socket so that there's no starvation. Like, you don't actually want, I only want to flush my socket when I'm draining the queue, because the queue might never be drained, and you're just going to sit there. Um, so that's a neat trick. Uh, well, that's pretty good timing. That's, those are all the random thoughts I had to share.